So let me thank very much the organizers of this meeting for giving us the floor to talk to philosophers. We don't usually do this. And uh, uh, I will follow the instructions of, uh, uh, of yesterday. I will only talk about things I understand, or at least vaguely understand. And I will not venture at all into philosophy. But I think uh, Sebastian, who is here, uh, will do a better job to probably make the bridge, because he's both a physicist and now a philosopher. Is this correct? Uh, right. So I was given the duty to uh, talk about holographic dualities and quantum gravity. And uh, I will try to explain to you uh, the following things. Here is the content. Uh, first, very briefly, I will give you the basic idea, which is simple to explain. But uh, it's good to recount the history, the little history of it. And, in particular, I want to explain to you that this idea didn't come out of the blue or out of nothing. It came by following some kind of Ariadne's thread, following very precise arguments that grew out of string theory, and I would say very precise mathematical statements, as you will see, which is what, in a sense, gave more confidence to the reality of this correspondence. So uh, even though this is a talk, of, uh, you know, this is a conference about the philosophy of science, uh, I think it's good to also follow the history of the ideas a little bit, because this shows how these ideas grow. Then, very briefly, I will try to tell you why there was so much excitement for about 20 years now. Actually, I realized through thought that it's 20 years since this idea was really put uh, on the table. And one may arguably say it was the last really revolutionary idea uh, in this kind of theoretical physics, at least. Uh, so there was lots of activity. I will basically not even talk about it. And I will try to go very quickly to quantum gravity and try to say what one hopes to learn, actually, out of this. Uh, and what little still one has learned about quantum gravity from this. So this talk uh, will be uh, followed by three other talks, by Sebastian, by Gary Horowitz, who will, I think, uh, talk about similar things. So hopefully I will introduce some of the material they will use, uh, and also maybe by Ted Jacobson, although I'm not sure what he will talk about. No. How do I point to so, this yeah. OK, so uh, a little history and the basic idea. So the starting point is a formula, as always in physics. What allows you to focus energy and attention is a formula, not an idea. It's rare that an idea without a formula flies. The formula uh, is a famous formula for the entropy of a large black hole. Uh, here are the two gentlemen associated <coughs> with it, Bekenstein and Hawking. And uh, this formula is amazing in many respects, actually. Uh, first of all, you see that it's a quantum formula. There is an h bar in the denominator. If you take h bar to zero, this formula doesn't make sense. So the black hole has an entropy, which is a quantum entropy. Secondly, it's a geometric formula. It's actually proportional to the area of the horizon of a black hole, <coughs> made dimensionless by the only combination of fundamental constants that uh, can do it, namely the speed of light and Newton's constant that enters into Newton's law. Finally, there is a, an all-important one-fourth. In some sense, this one-fourth is the only significant number in this formula, because the rest is dimensional analysis. So getting this one-fourth is important, and you will see how yeah. as the talk unfolds. So that's a very nice formula, and actually uh, it tells you many things. First of all, black holes do look to outside observers, like thermodynamical systems. The matter that fell in and is veiled to the outside carries entropy. That's the bekenstein hawking entropy. <coughs> As I said, the entropy has a universal, actually, geometric form. That's also quite amazing. 
This formula is true in all sorts of theories, in all sorts of dimensions. It doesn't depend on much, actually. It's almost the same combination. What can change is Newton's constant in different dimensions, but uh, the rest is always the same. So an amazingly universal formula. And as I said, the entropy has a quantum origin. Black hole, for, uh, this makes no sense. BH note is both black hole and Bekenstein Hawking, so I'm myself confused. Uh, the Bekenstein Hawking formula makes no sense if H bar is zero. Now, the entropy, as you know, is an intuitively elusive concept of physics. It's probably the hardest concept to teach when you are teaching undergraduate physics. It is a measure of information. <coughs> Sorry if I'm being extremely slow here. Uh, tell me to speed up if you want. But uh, let me remind you the basic formula, the Shannon entropy. If you have, say, a binary digit, which is, say, a coin flip, or a zero or one, or a spin a half in quantum physics, the formula for the entropy is this, right? Minus P0 log P0, minus P1 log P1, where P is the probability of the random process that generates zero and ones. So it has the good properties of being zero when the system is frozen. If P0 is one, say, if you are sure that it's zero, that's vanishing. And this corresponds to zero temperature in physics. And of being maximal when there is maximal uncertainty. So when the two probabilities are a half, this gives you log two, and that's the maximal entropy, or the maximal capacity of a qubit for storing information. And this corresponds to infinite temperature in the sense of a physical system. Now, this is a beautiful formula. Again, uh, the normalization of S is a convention, of course, here. So if you are a chemist, you would multiply this by Boltzmann's constant, K. But up to this multiplicative normalization, the rest uh, is pretty much determined by these simple properties, which uh, you see here, and which I will continue over here. Namely, the other key property of entropy is that it is extensive. If you have qubits, or cube digits, at your, at, at, uh, n digits, sorry, at your disposal, you can basically store information n log 2. So that's what one means by extensive. If you put n things together, you multiply by n the entropy. And of course, in physics, normally n, the number of degrees of freedom or of spins in a magnet and so on, is proportional to volume. However, the black hole formula uh, is not proportional to volume of space. It's as if all the information was stored on the horizon of the black hole, which tells us that the black hole interior is not like normal space. That's obvious. If it was like normal space, we could store uh, entropy in it proportional to the volume and not proportional to the area. Um, now, yes? Entropy is not an absolute quantity. It depends on what's going on. It's entropy with respect to something. This is an entropy that governs the interaction with the outside. And from the outside, uh, we don't interact uh, with the interior, but only with the boundary, because it is an horizon. So, everything you said is fine, of course, but then there is a step yeah. from here to the volume inside must be special, which seems to be... Yeah, what I have in mind, we just, can come back to this, no, but what just, I have in mind is just, just, that you throw in can I finish? Oh, yes, it, it seems to me that what, what one could say is that the entropy is, the inside is special as far as external observers are concerned, which is something we already know from classical geometry. Because that's the entropy for okay. all of times. And that's semantics. Let's, no, we can come semantics. back to because it. Because there's but, uh, a lot of physics that follows from that. So uh, if, I, if well, I enter the horizon, the, the, a priori, there is no reason for the interior to be special. Fine. So again, if you don't like this sentence, I'm happy to put it on hold yeah, no, for the moment. Like but what I'm saying is that if you had a box, you could throw in normally a number of qubits or spins proportional to volume, you know, as seen from the outside, and store as much entropy. You cannot do this to a black hole. The black hole will grow so that the area is proportional to the entropy you are losing. Okay. That's the only thing I want to say here. But we can come back in the end if it's important. 
So, in a sense, you know, this is the basic idea, if you want, uh, of the story, which is which was articulated nicely by Herald Hoft and then by Saskind in 93 and 94, even though it was already in the formula, in a sense. Uh, and the idea, you know, carries the name of holography because of the famous, as you know, work of Gabor, who saw that if you store, if you record both phases and amplitudes, then you can store 3D information on a 2D surface or on a 2D screen. Uh, that's the usual uh, sense of the word holography, and it's very similar to what we want here. In a sense, what these people proposed is that the black hole horizon is a holographic screen, and therefore it should be possible to describe physics of the black hole in a way to be made precise by using a 2 plus 1 dimensional theory as opposed to a 3 plus 1 dimensional theory where 1 is time. Now, Ideas can be nice, as I said, but their importance is hard to gauge before they are formulated as a very precise mathematical statement. And I think that's a constant of theoretical physics. And this precise mathematical statement came about with the famous paper of Juan Maldacena, yeah, which is called The Large and Limit of Superconformal Field Theories and Supergravity, and by two companion papers by people that uh, yeah, were already playing in way with the idea, in, uh, in particular Gupser, Klebanov, Polyakov, and Witten. They came up to uh, months later, uh, and all this happened within a few months' period. Now, again, I won't make all the history of the idea. Uh, there were earlier thoughts that fell in place once Mandesena's paper came out. Uh, for instance, Thibault, you know, has a secret life. Uh, when he doesn't calculate post-Newtonian approximation, he does also some other things. And one of the nice things he had done very early on was to propose a model of the black hole as a membrane. That's called the membrane paradigm. Uh, it couldn't really make very precise until ADS-CFT. But nowadays in ADS-CFT, it's what one calls fluid gravity correspondence. Another very interesting uh, insight was brought by the study of asymptotic symmetries in anti-de Sitter space by Brown and Leno. Again, these things were totally decoupled from string theory at the time. Yeah, and uh, these people showed that <coughs> asymptotic symmetries of anti-de Sitter space are the same as those of the conformal group, conformal field theories. Uh, and then two closer to the real young mill string theory correspondence that I will show in a minute were Hoft's uh, uh, ideas about the topological one over n expansion in quantum field theory, and Polyakov, uh, who was talking about the Liouville mode on the string as a fifth holographic coordinate, although again he couldn't formulate it in the precise way that it was formulated by Maldesena. But I was in a summer institute where Polyakov was talking about this a couple of years before uh, Maldesena's paper. He was trying to think about it, but you see again, uh, there is a big step when you make something as a precise mathematical statement as opposed to a general intuitive idea. Okay, this Maybe so much about I history. Very, yes. uh, complete about the history. Yes. Yes. The work of Igor Klebanov on the absorption. Uh, right, plate. but this I will say a little more here. Okay. Of course, I mean, you know, this is a very sketchy history, and there are, as usual, there are many things that converge to make this happen, and I will say now a little more, because what I want to try to explain to you is that really this was the result of following, I repeat, Ariadne's thread. Uh, you know, it wasn't only ideas, it was trying to make sense of very precise questions and very precise calculations that grow out of string theory. So let me try to describe a little bit how this went about. Okay. First of all, this is a duality, and a duality means basically that one has two or more mathematical descriptions of the same physical object. Philosophers, please excuse me here, you know, I 
I vaguely know what I mean by a physical object, but I won't define it. <laughs> now, there's a famous precedent, that's particle wave duality in quantum mechanics, but the two are not really the same in a way that I will try to explain. As you know, uh, in quantum mechanics, an electron is neither a particle nor a wave, but one or the other description can be a good approximation in a given experiment. Okay, that's what it really means. So, Heisenberg's uncertainty, if you write it as velocity and position, tells you that the product of the uncertainties or the error bars is h bar over the mass of the particle. And if you take a very heavy molecule, say 10,000 atomic units, this is a very small number. You know, if you have precision of a micron in the center of mass, it's a few microns per second in velocity, so that's good for most of the things we do in classical physics. However, we know that in generalized double slit experiments, such molecules can be shown to behave like waves. Actually, there are some beautiful experiments being done on this with very large organic molecules. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, that's another approximation in less common circumstances, which captures also part of what the quantum theory is describing. The two descriptions are here approximations, so it's not that we have an exact mathematical statement, the theory of particles and the theory of waves that are identical, describing the same physics. They are both describing limits of an underlying theory, which is quantum mechanics. Now, in the case at hand, the physical object is the black hole, or some idealized version of a black hole. And one views this from two different perspectives. And uh, as I said, the, the story was developed in a very dense and very exciting five-year period, roughly, from 93 to 98. And I won't do justice to all the contributions that led to it, but here are a few key points okay, to just follow the story. The first point was covered by Gabriele, who is also, whose paper was, in a sense, the kickstart of string theory. And basically, the, the first statement is that by the early 90s, I would say, there was accumulated and substantial evidence that th string theory is a perturbatively consistent theory of quantum gravity. Yeah. By this, I mean that uh, it gives finite answers to perturbative calculations, that it gives a variant or variants of Einstein's theory in the classical or long-range limit. So some kind of Newton's laws or augmented Newton's laws can be derived from string theory. And to arrive to this conclusion, one had to overcome various hurdles. You know, it's not as if it was an easy road. Uh, in particular, the idea of using this and showing, as Gabriele said, that a spin-2 particle is in the string spectrum was uh, put forth by these three gentlemen, uh, including Joel Scherk, who unfortunately died very young, but who had a major impact in this field. Uh, and even so, the story wasn't complete because there were very dangerous divergences that people showed in field theory, and string theory somehow managed to avoid them, again by doing the calculation, in the famous green Schwartz paper of 84. So, let's start from this statement. Now, perturbative for, again, philosophers, simply means small fluctuations around a given classical solution or background, which most of the time for us is either Minkowski space-time or anti de Sitter space-time times some compact manifold. Gabriele described this nicely. So, I won't say more about string theory, you know, particles, uh, are really vibrating strings. Uh, when you see them from far apart, they look point-like. Their mass is the center of mass energy of the string, and their spin is the angular momentum of the string. Now, again, I, I should uh, warn you, the known classical backgrounds of this theory are not our world. In particular, uh, the Sitter space, which is the expanding, <coughs> accelerated expansion we observe, does not solve the classical equations of string theory. And furthermore, there are lots of fifth forces, uh, and this I will come back to the end. However, 
uh, I would say two things, but first of all, there is no obstruction of principle, and really people have looked very hardly at this. There is no obstruction of principle for string theory to describe our world. It's simply that technically we don't yet know how to do it. And secondly, if we go very close to the paradoxes around quantum gravity and the conceptual puzzles raised by it, these differences are probably not very important. So that was step uh, one. Now, step two, which I think was as crucial as any other idea in this field, uh, came about by a marvelous four-page paper of Polczynski in '95. Here is what it is. Now, nonlinear theories in general often have soliton excitations. A soliton is a stable, localized lump of energy. Uh, it's a solution of nonlinear field equations, and it doesn't disperse, so it can move without being dispersing or, uh, or deformed. There are many examples, you know, magnetic monopoles, cosmic strings, and all sorts of theories. Tsunamis, even though people don't totally agree if the tsunami is a soliton, but actually, in a sense, solitary waves were first proposed by Russell by looking at an English canal where he saw something moving along without being dispersed. So solitons are everywhere in modern physics. Now, what Polczynski pointed out is that in string theory, they have a striking description which doesn't involve solving any nonlinear equations. The description is here in words. If you have a soliton, it describes a trajectory. On this trajectory, closed strings can break open. That's called the deep brain, D for Dirichlet. And here is a picture. In a sense, this is a deep particle. What can happen to a closed string is that it can break open and have its end point stuck on the deep particle. And for a deep string, it's the same. The trajectory is two-dimensional, and it's a manifold on which open strings can end. Now, don't get fooled. You know, these are pictures, but there are extremely precise equations behind it. In particular, all the properties of the solitons, that's what I want to get across, the mass, the charges, the precise dynamics are derivable from this picture. It's not a model of solitons. So there are no adjustable parameters. It's really a mathematical inference that I won't have time, of course, to describe. But I can say more if you want at the end. <clears throat> now, there's another key observation once you accept this, which is that on these solitons, uh, you have open strings. But if you have many of them, you have to say where the endpoints of the open string end. So automatically, one finds matrices, right? Because an open string that goes from 1 to 2 is the off-diagonal component of a 2 by 2 or a 3 by 3 matrix, and so on. And again, it was one of the very early nice works in string theory by André Neuville and Joel Scherk, who had shown that open string theory in the low energy limit is a spin one gauge theory, a la Young Mills. Now, this, as you know, is the cornerstone of the standard model. So here we are on more familiar ground. These are theories we think we understand a little better. Uh, so that's what you get by looking at the low energy dynamics of these guys. Now, point number three. Uh, so we have seen that closed string theory has solitons on which the Young Mills theory lives. And at very low energies, closed string theory reduces, I told you, to a theory of Einstein's gravity, to a variant of Einstein's theory of gravity. But once you have a gravity theory, generic gravitational solitons are black holes. And therefore, we already arrive at the conclusion that black holes can be described, but they describe this in quotation marks, because I haven't told you how exactly, by Young Mills theory. Right. Now, this was this observation was taken advantage of a year after Polczynski's paper by the first precise microscopic calculation of this famous bekenstein hawking formula I showed you in the beginning. The details are not very important for us here. 
There are technical details which force you to go to something called the free charge near extremal black hole in five dimensions. You can do it then in many other contexts. The only point that you have to uh, keep in mind here is the following thing. The same way that a point particle looked at with a loop was a string, in the same way some of these black holes, when you look at them at a, with a loop, they look pretty horrible. It's a picture like this, but a picture with no free parameters other than numbers. Numbers of D5 brains and D strings, a number of momentum units. This whole thing happening in a compact space, you know, all these things are not of infinite extent. They are wrapping some compact space. So in a sense, it's some sort of microscopic model, you know, some kind of Ising model of the black hole, uh, which comes out of this uh, story I told you before, no free parameters other than the ends. Now, you do the calculation that you are doing usually in statistical mechanics, in freshman year statistical mechanics, you compute the entropy for large numbers of these guys, you find the formula that's very nice, and then you compare with the bekenstein hawking entropy of the corresponding black hole, and they agree, including the factor of one-fourth. Yeah, that's crucial, because if we didn't get the factor of one-fourth, we would be simply saying that string theory knows something about the area law of black hole entropy. It knows exactly, at least in these very limited cases, which are these three charge near external black holes, it knows exactly how to count degrees of freedom and gives the expected answer. Actually, I was looking at this, at this conference's uh, poster and I saw this picture. Was this supposed to mean this, what I'm just describing? You know, this uh, black hole, this seems to be deep brains and maybe these are strings, but I don't know who made the poster. El Lisitsky is the artist. I see, so was he a Russian constructivist? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> so it fits. From the 20th. He yeah. didn't draw it for us. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the 20s, okay, so he didn't know about deep brains. But uh, maybe yeah. he knew about black holes. <laughs> <laughs> now, depending on one's mood, when you see this, and I remember this was the mood in 96, you may say either, wow, you know, that's amazing, or if you are in a less good mood, you may say, okay, fine, all you checked is that string theory is self-consistent, you know, it reproduces correctly thermodynamics, that's nice, but don't get too excited about it. Uh, indeed, I mean, uh, you know, I, I was rather on this side, but I can understand fully also, uh, talking with Miguel Virasor at the, uh, the time, for instance, who was saying, fine, you know, you check thermodynamics, that's nice, but go on. <laughs> Now, but the question of course now arises, so we got the entropy, can the other properties of the black hole also be described by young Mills theory? By the way, because uh, there is still the problem that I mean, when you can count, you need an index. When you can count something, it is not a black hole yet. And then there is a transition. Yes. Uh, which is okay. not just to say yeah. that it's, although it's marvelous, I'm on the wow side. <laughs> yes. Uh, there is... So, uh, yeah, let me repeat, I mean, I indeed skipped over technical details. You need three charges to have the horizon. You need supersymmetry, which means near extremality, to be able to extend from the black hole to the uh, deep brain picture without the phase transition. So, indeed, these are not astrophysical black holes. They are not even Schwarzschild black holes, as you know well. However, in this corner of space, you know, you get the one-fourth honestly without fitting any parameter. Now, so at this point, as I said, so can you compute anything else than the entropy? At this point enters the crucial insight of Montesena. In the deep brain background, let's consider the limit where both the string and the Planck scales are taken to infinity. So gravity decouples. The young Mills theory, uh, let's assume it's not always the case, that it can be defined autonomously. This means that it's UV complete or normalizable or has a fixed point in the UV. So assume the field theory of the deep brains can be defined autonomously. Then there is a decoupling. This means that what you get in this limit is basically a young Mills theory 
coupling to free gravity waves. Okay. Now take the same physical object, think of it as a black hole, there are no deep brains now, there are only closed strings. Again, in some cases, which are the same as those in which you have decoupling, when you get close to the horizon of the black hole, it starts looking like a deep throat, actually. It looks like some kind of sphere times anti-de-sitter space, which is a peculiar space I will say a word about. Now, you may say, well, what happens here? Well, you see now, because near the horizon there is an infinite, a huge, infinitely huge red shift, all the energies get, sh get shifted to the red, anything, including an element, an elephant living down here, will be there in your theory at low energies. In particular, this means, since that's where you start for, from the full string theory, anything that goes all the way down to the throat, the full ten-dimensional string theory lives down here. On the other hand, gravity waves of extremely long wavelength don't see this object, right? They don't scatter on it, so they decouple. So in a sense, here are two arguments that seem to describe the same physical object in the same limit, very low energies, and you see that they share a common additive factor, free gravity waves, how about removing it and saying that the other two things are identical. So this leads to a simple, mathematically sharp statement, which is the statement of holographic duality. It says that a particular quantum field theory turns out, again, I'm skipping over the Susie part, it's technical, but I will come back to this in the end. N equal 4 supersymmetric Young Mills theory in four dimensions is identical to a full string theory living in this throat of the black hole, which has a particular geometric form. It's anti de Sitter space in one more dimension, as you expect from the generic idea. This is 4, this is 5, times a compact space that shrinks to zero. Now, this came to be known as CFT-ADS or ADS-CFT, but watch out, CFT is indeed CFT. ADS means, for the moment, string theory in ADS background. It doesn't mean general ADS. It doesn't make sense. You need a quantum gravity, and the quantum gravity is string theory. I think the S5 radius is, uh, is also the order of the anti uh, radius. Yes, but as you move to the boundary, the conformal boundary is only the boundary of anti de Sitter because the sphere becomes bigger, and that's the only thing that matters. Of course, yeah, you are you're right. Okay, so I told you how the idea came about. Now, why was there so much excitement about this? Let me try to say a few words. So, we have a proposed duality, a proposal of duality between a conventional gauge theory, like those of the standard model, and the string theory in anti de Sitter space. In principle, they both describe the same physical object, the horizon of a particular class of black holes. So you may say that duality is a statement of mathematical equivalence. It's not like particle wave duality, where you had two approximations of some other theory. Here, in a sense, you, if you are optimistic, you have two different theories that describe the same object, the black hole horizon. Now, this is in principle because, in practice, we are really limited by the available computational tools, and it's even a bit worse than this. Uh, pertur perturbation theory, uh, I'm sorry, the computational tools we really have is essentially perturbation theory around classical solutions on both sides of the duality, and a little more, the little more being semi-classical or instant on and so on techniques. But it's always, you know, we are bound in a sense always by this. Now, it's a bit worse than this because string theory is indeed not defined in any other way. So it's not only in practice, you know, you may say indeed string theory is defined through perturbation theory, Feynman diagrams, and we don't know any other way to define it. That has been, of course, one of the big questions of string theory. So even though I told you before that there is this duality, what I meant here 
is some very incomplete definition, a theory that's only defined through perturbation theory, and one doesn't know how to really go beyond. <coughs> now, how about the other side? Well, this is also computationally only approached by perturbation theory, but it's a little better, you know, in the sense that there is an action you can think of putting on the lattice, so young Mills is a little more defined, although don't forget that one of the clay millennium problems, you get one million dollars for this, is to prove also that young Mills theory is defined as a theory. So you know, both sides, if you are a purist mathematician, neither side is, de is defined. If you are a physicist, you say, well, yeah, young Mills is more or less defined. I can imagine putting it on a lattice and doing numerical calculations, even though in practice, in the end, we are all doing, finally, perturbative uh, Feynman diagrams. Are you talking about real young means or... N equal four supersymmetric. So you say but even it, that theory is not uh, completely well defined. Is it? Any now, can you convince a mathematician that this is... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Vincent can argue um, this, you know. It's, uh, it's, it, it seems to be an integrable model, right. so we know Very more and more about it, yes. even without using a lattice approximation. Very good. Whether but the real young Mills doesn't seem to be yeah. integrable. So I will say a word about this, but when you say we know more and more, we know only the spectrum, we don't know the interactions, and uh, uh, again, a mathematician wouldn't accept this as a well-defined object. For a theoretical physicist, this is close to being well defined. String theory, on the other hand, is only defined through perturbation theory. So in a sense, you may say, OK, this gives us a chance to define also string theory in a different way and without necessarily referring to perturbation theory. Now, a bit more precisely, you know, string theory has two free parameters. It's the string tension, which is an inverse length squared, L string squared, and a dimensionless coupling constant, the string coupling, which is basically a ratio of the Planck length to the string length to the power of four, <coughs> up to a numerical coefficient. If you go to an empty de Sitter background of radius L, the convenient expansion parameters for string theory are the ratios of these two fundamental lengths to the radius of your background geometry. So it's L over LS to the fourth. Let's call this by convention the parameter lambda. And L over L Planck to the four, which you see from these relations, is lambda over G string. Classical gravity of the Einstein variety is obtained, of course, when this space is much, much bigger than this ultraviolet scale. So L is much, much bigger than both the string and the Planck scale which means that both these parameters are extremely large. Now, what can you do in string theory? I told you that it's only defined perturbatively. Actually, this means that it's only defined in a, a perturbatively as a power series in G-string, but integrability that uh, Vincent mentioned can sometimes allow you to handle exactly the parameter lambda. So lambda, sometimes you can take anything you want. G-string, you only know how to do perturbation theory. That's how uh, string theory has been developed. Up to now. Go to the Young-Mills theory side, also two parameters, a Young-Mills coupling constant, and the number of colors, if you think of Young-Mills as a theory on a QCD with MC colors. Now, Hoof defined, as I said early on, the diagrammatic expansion that Harry carries his name. It can be organized con conveniently in powers of one over the number of colors, and a parameter lambda, which is basically the number of colors times the young mills coupling to the square. Now, I call this lambda same name as that because the duality identifies these two parameters. Now, the planar limit, NC goes to infinity, we have known all along that the Young-Mills theory simplifies. In particular, the perturbative expansion becomes convergent, but explicit calculations are still extremely hard. So it's simplified, but not enough to solve it. However, it simplifies things because only a subset of diagrams uh, 
surviving this limit. However, as I said, contrary to string theory, now there is an action principle. So at least background independent computations can be envisaged. Okay, once I have an action, I can think of all solutions of it, as Steve said in his talk. I can put it on the lattice and so on. So we are a bit better off on the young mill side. Now, ADSFT identifies the parameters lambda and identifies the number of colors as precisely the ratio of the radius of ADS to the Planck scale up to a numerical coefficient, which is known. I just didn't put it to the transparency. Now, the two sides are, however, a priori tractable in opposite regions. But in the planar limit, and C goes to infinity with lambda fixed, we have a simpler thing to check. On the one side, you have planar Young Mills, Young Mills were the only key diagrams with planar topology. On the other hand, because this is the limit where the string becomes free, we have a quantum string, but which is free. And that's where the two things have been matched very precisely. Now, I'm again going to skip over, you know, 10 years of marvelous technical developments, powerful new techniques of quantum integrability, starting with a very nice paper by Mina Hanzarenko in 02, then Staudacher, Beiser, a group at the Ecole Normale, Gromov, Kazakoviera, and many other people have worked on this. And I will just give you two transparencies, a flavor of why this was very nice. Here is the diagram of these two parameters. That's one over a number of colors. And this is this hoofed coupling lambda. The red thing, the red region, is the re region of classical young Mills theory. The green region is the region not even of string theory, but of supergravity. You know, that's the region where both the string scale and the Planck scale as lengths are taken to zero. So you can just do gravity or supersymmetric gravity here. The blue region is interesting. On one side, you have this planar limit of young Mills. On the other side, as I told you, you have free but quantum strings. Free in the sense that they don't join and split because uh, the Planck scale or Newton's constant has been taken away. That's where matching occurred in the middle of this. The really hard quantum gravity region is up here. Okay. And that's hard still to address. Uh, however, we start having now a nice picture. And let me here say that it is also the hallmark of good science. This shouldn't be forgotten to provide solutions to older and previously unrelated problems. I would like to stress this because Steve Kalib said that we learned everything about everything but not about quantum gravity. He's right, but still that's hallmark of good science, I think. Computing and resumming Feynman diagrams in four-dimensional young Mills theory is an extremely tedious and of great practical importance problem. In particular, people computing QCD backgrounds at LHC have been doing this for years and years. And the efforts to solve the planar limit of young Mills date back to the 70s with lots of, again, nice ideas that didn't really fly. The idea that there is a master field or some classical configuration governing the limit, reduction from four to zero dimensions, the butchka y reduction, the loop equations of Polyakov and Migdal, and so on. Now, in a sense, we see that the theory is simple, becomes simple, it becomes free quantum strings. It is indeed a special theory, and it is, in a sense, solved now. But neither of these ideas was really heads on. Let me just show you one slide which must impress you. I think I, I said woe to this. You know, look at one quantity, for instance. There is an operator in the Young Mills theory called the Conici <coughs> operator. It's something that has spin at least two, never mind. And the scaling dimension of this operator should be the same as the energy of a particular quantum string with the corresponding quantum numbers. Now you compute this, and if you were doing Feynman diagrams, you would stop here with 100,000 Feynman diagrams to compute. 
Now, with these so-called quantum spectral curves that came out of thinking of this as a string, an integrable string, you know, you go down to here, you can very nicely match throughout the whole regime. Numerically, you can compute the whole thing. But it's amazing agreement. Yeah. G here is the square root of uh, Toft coupling over 4 pi. This is in a paper of two young people, Marty and Wolling. But it shows to you, you know, that we are learning things, amazing things, including about theories that have been at the center of attention for 30 years. Now, OK, once you have seen this, you imagine that there exist many problems of quantum field theory at strong coupling, for which only numerical approaches were and are available. Two prime examples are the part gluon plasma and quantum critical points perhaps underlying ADSC <coughs> superconductivity. And ADSFT provides a new semi-analytic handle, semi-analytic handle to such problems, because you still have to engineer the precise theory that corresponds to this physics. <coughs> but I won't say more about this. We are here interested in the opposite arrow. Instead of using Einstein's equations to solve strongly coupled field theories, can we use quantum field theory to learn about strong quantum gravity? And that's the last and final part of my talk, which hopefully will be continued. So back to quantum gravity. But I can stop here for questions. I have another, if there are any. Yes, please. It's just a, just a small question. You mentioned this uh, stack of the three brains and how we could look at it in a limit and obtain two different pictures. As yes. I understood it, we're looking at it in two very different regimes, the GSN much larger than one and the GSN yes. much Correct. smaller than one. So these two pictures yes. or the decoupling limits are current in two very different limits. What is the argument that nothing special happens as we go from GSN much smaller than one to GSN? So here is part of the argument. So that's why I insisted on this. You are right, and as Thibault said, for special quantities protected by supersymmetry, the argument is supersymmetry. You just know that there is some protection against turning on GS. So the pictures, you are right, the pictures I draw really apply to two limits. However, the thing can be defined in between from both sides. And for some special quantities, uh, it's automatic that there are no corrections. But this is not a special quantity. You know, this is a string that's highly quantum and highly non-supersymmetric. So that's why this is, I think, amazing evidence. Here, you are really extrapolating from the two pictures. And there is marvelous agreement in the middle coming from both sides. You know. And there is a convergent expansion from young Mills. And there is quantum integrability of the string from the other side, and we get this. So it's much better than simply supersymmetric protection. OK, back to quantum gravity. Now, the first thing to observe, as I said, is that ADSCFT proposes a partially background independent formulation of quantum gravity. The partial is crucial. Uh, I think Gary made the point yesterday. It really defines quantum gravity with specific boundary conditions, which are those pertaining to the sitter space. So quantum gravity with these boundary conditions at infinity is described, according to this conjecture, by a Young-Mills theory. Now, this is a conventional QFT, and although it is hard to come up with rigorous proof, most physicists have no doubt that it exists and must be free of all pathologies. Again, that's a statement, not a proof. It's a claim, not a proof. And it would be surprising and marvelous if someone came up with a proof of the opposite, I think. But for now, we can pretty much safely assume that this theory cannot have information laws, and it cannot have any physical singularities, namely singularities that tell you that your description breaks down. Now, a word about anti-de Sitter boundary conditions. You know, anti-de Sitter space is like a trap, a gravitational trap. It has a metric, here it is, with a radial coordinate, which when it goes to infinity, that's called the boundary of anti-de Sitter, uh, you get infinite blue shifts. You see, this multiplies the usual Minkowski metric. 
in particular time is multiplied by e to the qr, so energies get blue shifted, and that's why massive stuff cannot propagate to the boundary. It needs infinite energy. It bounces back and comes back in. So, anti deceiver is a very nice box, in a sense, for quantum gravity. Okay, it only defines a box. However, what happens inside is up for grabs. No one tells you that the inside has to be anti deceiver You can have all sorts of things, small black holes forming and evaporating, singularities a la Hawking Penrose appearing in the geometric limit, yeah, and so on. All this must be described then by young Mills, if what we said is right. Now, often, I don't know why, people have adopted a unique convention for the name of a couple, Alice and Bob, <laughs> and uh, I'll go by the convention, but the issue is summarized by the diverging accounts of a trip uh, taken by an otherwise happily married couple, Alice and Bob. <coughs> Alice is the one that falls into the black hole, and she is extremely well versed in GR, uh, while Bob waits more easily on the outside, and he's highly quantum. Now here's what Alice says. Now we are back to relativity. Alice reaches the horizon after a finite time on her clock, crosses its sipping coffee, that's what relativity tells us, you know, a very big, nearly flat horizon, nothing happens, you just go ahead nicely. Just careful not to be torn apart by tidal forces. Uh, then she continues her travel, but then at some point hits a space-like singularity where all hell breaks loose, including GR, and time ends in the sense that we don't know what to do there and beyond. That's her account. What is Bob's account? Bob sees absolutely no drama. You know, he, his wife takes an infinite time to fall in, but that's not unusual. Uh, eventually comes out after the evaporation of the black hole. All the information on her agenda is intact, no information loss, although collecting it and Alice also may require you know, detectors at all corners of the universe to collect back the information uh, and a very expensive medical <coughs> machine to put back Alice, but though everything is there. And you see the two accounts seem contradictory. Can the accounts be reconciled? In a sense, that's a question that has focused a lot of attention <coughs> post ADSFT. Why are you saying that Alice comes out okay? I mean, the, the, After a, the a I'm assuming the black hole will evaporate. It's a small black hole. It will eventually evaporate. I'm sitting on the boundary and collecting all the products. Yes, so it's a big quantum thing and the there is a very small amplitude for Alice to come out in the same way. Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's why I need this very expensive <laughs> machine to put here back. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, of course. Course. But I haven't lost any information about how Alice looked and what she was. If sure. I could, yes. That's what I mean, okay. of course. Can I ask a question about um, where this Hawking radiation ends up? So. Um, is it just first classically? Can a particle, can a geodesic reach the boundary? Um, yeah, is that's it only a good if question. It's a radial null geodesic, or can any other geodesics reach the boundary? Right. So Bob has to sit not at the mathematical boundary, but inside, of course, at some cutoff region, obviously. He has to orbit uh, the thing. Uh, and there, everything can reach it eventually, uh, although. You may want to argue that maybe all the quanta don't reach there. However, they will be going around anti deceiver space if they don't reform a black hole, and eventually they will hit this cutoff region near the boundary. Okay, that's the <coughs> picture. But uh, again, let uh, you know. Let's come back. But we can uh, argue. What I want mainly to say is that there is no real contradiction here. The contradiction may well be a red herring like those that we have seen over and over in physics. It's simply due to the illusions of classical intuition and classical limits. We know, for instance, that there is no twin paradox in special relativity. There is no Schrodinger's cat paradox in quantum mechanics. These are part of the formulation of these theories. 
the paradoxes really are, arise when you think about the limits of Z of, uh, sorry, the other way around. <laughs> Infinite speed of light and zero Planck's constant. Uh, but, you know, so it's paradoxical to our intuition, but so what? The theories are mathematically well defined and describe exactly something which is what it is. So same here, you may say, maybe there is finally no contradiction, analysis, conflicting account of the trip might simply be a nightmare dissipated at finite and C and lambda. After all, her account corresponds to the exact limit and C equals to infinity and lambda equals to infinity. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the conservative and most plausible point of view. Uh, however, you still have to explain a little more, really, how this limit yeah, describes things. ADSFT provides a well-motivated, because it contains GR, and controllable in principle yeah, quantum Young Mills theory for resolving the conflict. If you could do all the calculations in Young Mills and see how the limit produces these pathologies, you would be done, in a sense. Because after all, as I said, in the quantum field theory, one expects a standard S matrix, for instance, black hole plus Alice plus pairs, giving black hole plus Alice plus shocking. Uh, now, this would be very small probability, as uh, uh, Thibault pointed out. However, you know, uh, everything will come out in such a way that no information is lost. Now, the technical details of how the horizon and singularity illusions arise look right now awfully hard. And clearly one needs ingenuity and patience and perhaps a simpler, sharp question to focus <coughs> energies because this is still not sharp enough, you know. How do you see the <coughs> trick of Alice in this limit? Okay. Now, this is a very, let me just say this, Carlo. Yeah, this is a hot present day topic and there are many ideas. I will mention a few now, yes. Um, this is a very beautiful picture of what might happen, and in fact, uh, it is indeed realized, as you know, in some simple models that this is. Um, there's one question we have not addressed here. Uh, if, I, if I don't go to the end point infinity limit, then uh, Alice uh, does not get a full singularity, uh, and, and, and uh, you don't have right. an actual... Uh, you believe, okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, let's suppose that this yeah. is the case, yeah. which, is a, which is a very interesting scenario. So we know what Bob outside measure, etc. What does Alice see yeah. in the theory, which is uh, for well, that's a, a good very, question. Very large, so I will make a comment not about in the limit. Yeah, yeah. That's I think that's question. an interesting question. Although you understand, that, uh, part of the problem of this kind of question is, please phrase it as a physical measurement or statement. And so that's harder because Alice is part so of the system. Part of local, local Good. So, okay. So I won't say much, but it's a, it's a good question and the question that people, of course, are asking. Now, I want, you know, as I say, this is being debated and I will just point to a few of the ideas in two transparencies, but we can discuss more afterwards. So there are many ideas. No, many of them are totally incompatible with one another, and none has really flied yet, so it's all up for grabs. There is an idea called the fastball idea, which says that both the horizon and the singularity are not unavoidable, even in the classical limit. There are smooth, long finger geometries where space ends. Outside, they look like black holes, but as you get close to the horizon, you find some other smooth geometry. Uh, that's one possibility. It's not my favorite because it's very much tied to extremality and supersymmetry, but maybe I'm wrong. Another one, which sounds totally revolutionary and I think also unlikely, but all these are statements of prejudice right now, which may change easily, you know, if someone does something nice. Uh, is that there is a firewall. General relativity breaks down simply and all hell breaks loose, not at the singularity, much before at the horizon of the black hole. So Alice and her pairs simply get blown up there 
much before hitting the similarity. If this were correct, in a sense, this would be really revolutionary because it does go against the simple application of the equivalence principle, which is that the horizon is locally flat space and nothing should happen. So it's unlikely, but there are uh, arguments for this. An idea that I liked and which answers partly Carlos' question uh, by Papadodimas and Raju is that one has to introduce some very mild state dependence. So what these people said is that simple observables, things that an infalling observer Alice would measure, cannot be defined absolutely. They depend on the precise quantum state of the black hole. And they make a case uh, using theorems of the variety that Alan Cohn mentioned yesterday for how this is compatible with <coughs> everything we know about black holes, including complementarity. Uh, the problem is that this is really now a deviation of quantum mechanics. The measurement process cannot be unitary, as has been argued nicely by Harlow, and therefore this is in some sense the most revolutionary departure because you are giving up one of the basic things of quantum mechanics. So I'm just saying, you know, I don't adopt any of these ideas. I'm just saying that people are playing with these ideas short of being able to compute. Because, you know, if you could compute with young Mills, there would be no reason to do ideas. Yeah. So I don't understand the details of Papa and Roger, but I'm pretty sure that from their viewpoint, all they're doing is describing how what happens in the quantum field theory you know, translates into a statements about observers outside a black hole in the ball. But from that viewpoint, no change of quantum mechanics is being made. It's just standard yeah. quantum field theory. But if you are trying to now translate this in the sense of black hole, what you are saying is that Alice is falling in. She just tries to measure, you know, a simple Newton experiment, and she throws a ball here and there. She's in flat space, normally, there should be some sort of independent definition of the operator, but no, the operator they are measuring, the observable, depends on the very precise quantum state of the black hole. Yeah, but it depends in what way? What uh, aspect of it depends on how much Okay, it uh, let's talk on the pause about it, but look at Harlow's paper, because he makes a more precise case for why this cannot be consistent with unitary evolution. Of course, we are getting also into the problems of quantum measurement and the observable in quantum mechanics and so on, but, uh, you know, it's, I agree, it's a good question and the answer is not final. However, I don't think you can reconcile this with all the standard conservative actions of quantum mechanics, in particular unitary evolution, including at the measurement process. Okay, okay but I would like to emphasize just for clarity that I'm pretty sure that the authors of that state of that interpretation or proposal, they don't agree that this violates anything about quantum mechanics I or think changes they agree. it. They're just doing quantum mechanics of quantum field theory in the CFC. <laughs> I guess what's disputable or under dispute is whether their proposed account of bulk observations could possibly correctly followed. Yeah, but that's reality. the point. I mean, the but theory... But they don't agree. I just, it sounded like you were saying that these people are proposing that we should modify quantum mechanics to resolve this mm -hmm. paradox, and I don't think that's what they're proposing. Of course, because <laughs> you are modifying quantum mechanics of an observer going through flat space. No, no, no. You know, so uh, you're disagreeing with me that you think they are modifying quantum mechanics? I think, think they're modifying I think there is no linearity in what oh, they propose. I, I would be shocked. Yeah. I mean, let me just emphasize a really important point. Just, I'll, I'll talk about this in my talk, but I mean, we, we, when you talk about an observer falling into a black hole and what are they going to measure, in general relativity, we know that you can't, you know, discuss that observable without characterizing it in an explicitly generally covariant way. Otherwise, it's meaningless. But once you do that, you're basically describing this, this observation with reference to the gravitational field that it's taking place in and where she came from when she fell in. But that gravitational field is quantized, and of course its quantum fluctuations, therefore, are affecting what she is measuring. So it's not you know, surprising that 
there should be some state dependence of what observable we're even talking about. But would you need, can you do what you just described without introducing non-unit revolution at the measurement process? I would think so. But, I mean, okay, let's, I mean, details, it's a very interesting question. Yeah, yeah, let's discuss it mm -hmm. on the break. I just have two or three more transparencies. I'm running out of time, but I, I agree it's a very interesting issue. And, uh, yeah. <coughs> Two more things, and then I'll stop. You know, entanglement and geometry. Uh, once one ac accepts this correspondence, a natural question is, well, the prime quantum quantity is entanglement. Does it have a geometric limit? There is a beautiful formula by Riwan Takayanagi that extends basically the bekenstein hawking formula to measure also entanglement, not only thermal entropy. There is the ER equals EPR. Uh, proposal that I won't talk about. It's still very ill-defined for the moment to, uh, to be worth a slide, but it's a very interesting <laughs> idea. Uh, finally, quantum chaos, you know, black holes scramble information at the maximum rate. And again, there is a very nice activity here, which led, and again, here is another spin-off of the story, to rigorous bound on the growth of chaos in a thermal system that wasn't known to specialists. You know, you just think about black hole horizons, you find something which can be proved without black holes and gravity, just plain quantum field theory. Uh, and it's a very nice uh, result too. And it's also a guide, saturating this bound is a guide towards trying to build models of Schwarzschild horizons. And many techniques are very useful, including Benson's uh, tensor models here. But the story is unfolding. It's not clear also what it went. Now, let me say that you know ideas are thrown out and tried, but not everything flies. Okay, don't think that every idea stays indefinitely on the table. Here is an idea that didn't fly. If you have anti-deceiver CFT, why not the sitter CFT? Well, people tried this, very good people tried this. It didn't leave us wiser up to now. So here is an example of something that maybe we'll, be, we'll see in the future again, but right now there's not much to say. So that's an ongoing debate. Now, now what should one hope for? And I want to finish with this. Ultimately, of course, we are physicists. You know, one would like to address the major observational puzzles of quantum gravity. And this we were talked about. We know them, dark energy, the cosmic microwave background, how to really derive it from the Big Bang, the fifth forces, and so on. Now, string theory does have some empirical success. For instance, uh, you know, it's the only quantum gravity theory that long, uh, goes a long way to reconciling us with what actually exists in nature. And one very nice calculation, for example, is that in a very large class of theories uh, called heterotic, what one finds is that forces do unify. One can calculate, and that's the only context where you can really calculate the scale at which they unify. That's all empirical data. We know that they unify at 10 to the 16 GB. And that's the only way to compute them if you fit in the known value of Planck's constant. Uh, however, and here I have an important parenthesis, it is also sufficiently developed to suffer empirical stress, as was pointed <laughs> out yesterday. <laughs> And we know, of course, this empirical stress. I think mostly it's resumed by these three lines, how to break supersymmetry while retaining the stability of the vacuum, and how to cure the massless scalars that generate fifth forces that are not observed. All this may or may not be part of the same story. Time will show if this is the right or false road to quantum gravity. But I cannot not comment on Carlos' checklist, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, because he was giving thumbs up 
to loop quantum gravity for producing a Hilbert space and thumbs down to string theory for not computing the mass of the electron. I think those are not really on par. And, uh, uh, I think we have a very good example that shows this. The example is QCD. We all will feel friends with QCD for 30 years. We have seen in this theory that the hardest thing to compute are Viking properties at long distances. Uh, even though the theory, you can put it on a computer, everything you want, it's a very simple theory by the standards of what we discard. This is really the hardest thing to compute. And Gabriele said it too, if I use Carlos' criteria, quark bug models would get a big thumbs up, and Young Mills theory would already be out, because classical Young Mills theory does not confine, nor does perturbative Young Mills theory. So let's be patient, you know, uh, and aware. Will ABS-CFT help in resolving these observational puzzles? What I would say uh, is that there is no clear indication or idea so far that what we are learning from ADSFT will help us with these problems. I don't think there is a clear idea of how to go. Yeah. But here, you know, one always resorts to grandmasters when one is found to such situations. Here is a marvelous quote from Dirac in New Zealand. Yeah. I think he's uh, one of the most amazing people in this field. Yeah. He was talking about Hamilton. He said, Hamilton, 100 years earlier, had set up another form of dynamics. He pursued this line of investigation just because it led to greater beauty and symmetry. There goes Dirac, that's his motto, of the equations. I believe this shows the genius of Hamilton that he was able to follow through a line of work whose importance was not evident until 100 years later. And this is, I find, a marvelous sentence. I learned this, he was learning this, without at the time realizing whether it would be important or not, simply because it was related to things that were important. I think that uh, should cheer us up a little. I'm not gloomy at all, <laughs> uh, as Carl said. I think uh, there is very nice things to uh, do, and here are my concluding remarks. Well, various quantum gravity proposals, you know, string theory is by far, in my book, the most conservative. Uh, Gabriele called it a Copernican revolution. I would call it a Copernican revolt, or, you know, <laughs> because it really tries to preserve all the basic principles. It doesn't give up any basic principle of quantum mechanics. It has smooth Einstein geometric limits. Uh, so we are not giving up for free if we are not push to the wall uh, any of the basic principles of physics. Holographic duality comes out of it, as I said, almost as a logical inference, and extends string theory, but cannot be disconnected from it. I insist on this because some people think ADS-CFT is now a different proposal. Well, as far as we know, the duals of CFTs are still string theories, even though they are probably very strongly coupled and in very highly curved spaces. Uh, but there are no counterexamples. Uh, and finally, we have a model in which to study the black hole paradoxes. I think one should pursue this and its many spin-offs and hope that it may lead to experiment as well, but how, no one knows. Thank you very much. Can I just ask a question of uh, clarification of the nature of the duality? Um, so you said it's the CFT is dual to string theory, but earlier you said string theory includes D brains. And so I'm just something I've always wondered: is it should we expect that included within this super Yang Mills theory is also a description of all the D brain excitations that we think are also states in string theory? <coughs> Um, that's a good question, yeah. I think the answer is yes, and there are examples where this can be computed, but of course it's not the original deep brains that created the black hole throat, right? Because these are a background. Now, if you try to change this, you are changing the boundary conditions of ADS. Right. No, so that's why it's... But deep brains moving in the middle of ADS, yes. The answer is yes. 
option. And is yeah, it should... known about how to describe those within the Young Mills theory? Within Young Mills theory, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, yes. I let the guardian respond. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Now, there, yeah. there are papers on how to describe certain D brains <laughs> in ADS or moving on the sphere. Uh, but certain, um, you need to take certain determinants of, of certain you know, collection of operators and stuff. Maybe you can show me a reference. Uh, thanks for this beautiful talk. Uh, I would argue, uh, if you allow me, with the second part of the sentence in your second paragraph. That is uh, no doubt that holographic duality is a child of, of, of string theory, that we all agree. But is this child going to be autonomous at some point? That's what I could uh, argue with you. Of course, it's too early to, to state, but you know that uh, Magdalena is thinking that this uh, uh, new ADS2 uh, or near ADS2 near CFT1 um, example is, although for the moment, limited to one and two dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it is an interesting new theory of gravity in which you, you have the, high, the two tower of massive, of, of high spin states, which is different from the one of string theory. It is not uh, growing like that, but remains uh, of the same order. But nevertheless, it seems to be a promising uh, new kind of uh, gravity theory, which may be uh, easier to solve because it relies on the melonic families rather than the planar glass. You know, uh, yeah, uh, I, I agree to the extent that string theory, as I said, does not have an independent, non perturbative definition of G string. So, what I'm saying is that whenever I think you find a geometry that has parameters that allow you to go to the geometric limit, you will discover string theory. Uh, now, this may prove to be wrong, and as you should know, SYK is still not a theory uh, uh, that can be talked about independently. Uh, but, you know, what you say is not inconsistent. I mean, a string theory in a very highly curved background may look very different from strings, of course, because, you know, if, if the ADS has the same radius of curvature as the string scale, who knows, you know, what the real geometry of the thing is. So, of course, when I say it's a string theory, is whenever you can go to a geometric limit where the scales uh, of the would-be string and the would-be Planck scale are much smaller than the geometry. Yeah, but otherwise one cannot talk about string theory. I mean, it's a way to define it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. no, no, please. so probably it's very stupid of me, but I didn't completely understand the paradox in the Bob and Alice uh, story. So, so where is the contradiction? So Bob, let's assume, is very well first in general relativity. Yes. So he knows no, that Alice. Alice, Alice so he. Alice. <laughs> uh, so Bob was out. No, no. Bob yeah, but Bob's outside. outside. Bob is outside. Yeah. yeah. And let's suppose that he also knows about general relativity. That he knows. <laughs> that he knows that Alice goes in. And he also knows that he will not see it. Yes. And so he knows all these other things, and he he knows that a terrible fate uh, is, is no, no, in store for her at, at the singularity. But I, I don't see any contradiction between the two no, stories. There is no contradiction because there is no terrible end that is similar. It's yeah, only an illusion of a limit. That's what I'm trying to say. If so, but what's the illusion exactly? The illusion is that if you took classical GR at face value, you would think that you hit a singularity and time ends. Mm -hmm. In the same way that you would be totally puzzled if your twin went out in space and came back and was older or younger than you, younger than you. Uh, and you didn't know that there is something which is the speed of light, which you shouldn't take to infinity. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, so, you know, in so this it's sense... About the singularity. It's all about the singularity. A singularity of a limit, so nothing really is singular if you believe that Young Mills has no reason to be singular, but singularities could arise in limits and they are just illusions. You know, that's indeed, no, I believe that's the no, most because I, it's, it's confusing. It's like when Gabriele is talking, for instance, about a high energy collision, okay? If you send two particles, only two, when you are in the regime where you create a black hole, okay, I mean, where it's most probable that you create a black hole with fixed B and J, the quantum state you create will evaporate and uh, 
you will get the two particles out only in a very small part of the very small amplitude. Yeah. You, you will get a mess out. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you cannot say it's the classic... This is a quantum process, so there is no paradox there, but you, you will never see Alice back except no with a probability ex 10 minus exponential minus s, where s is the entropy. Yeah, the paradox was the loss of quantum information. Yes, but that's okay. why it's unitary, let's say. If so Gabriele no could compute everything technically, yeah there would be a unitary matrix. Still, this unitary matrix gives a description of Alice coming out only with a very small amplitude, just to clarify things. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, not I that... Uh, I, I hope so, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but the way you formulate is a intact. bit... Intact, maybe this was... Yes, you the, say intact in the sense of Illusion, intact. No, in the usual sense. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. encoded. I, of course, <laughs> encoded. Yeah. Transformed, but encoded. Yeah. I have, a, I have a question, if I could. Uh, so, uh, I, I thought there were uh, non-trivial statements about how to uh, look at the interior of the black hole from the boundary theory, and that this was not completely straightforward in the ABS-CFT correspondence. Can you refresh? Our memory about yeah, that. I, I think Gary will talk about this. Um, related to the question, is but there it's a related. Is not there a singularity inside? I mean, yeah, can it's you also look at the absolutely. It's also related to the question that we were asking Papa de Dimas and Raju: Can I describe from the boundary the interior of a black hole, not of anti No, no, of the black hole. The I mean, black hole. I'm sorry. I don't okay. Know now that's how they came out with their proposal by using the fact that. If you only had access, you meaning the observer that will fall in, to a limited set of observables, you would evade a lot of no-go theorems that wouldn't allow you to have things that commute, for instance, with everything outside, inside uh, the horizon. And there is a very simple uh, mathematical theorem that I keep forgetting, but so I can remind you the names. Uh, which allows you to say, for instance, that if you take only subalgebras of the full algebra of operators, mm -hmm. you can have a state that's annihilated by all of them, and then you can build a complementary set of observables mm -hmm. that commute with them. Uh, so, in a sense, that was the beginning. Indeed, it's a crucial question. I mean, can the boundary describe the interior? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what do we mean? You see, always mm -hmm. we are we are asking questions that are not totally physically sharp. What are you? What do you want me to measure to answer your well, question? Well, distinguished microstates. But no, that's no problem because you have a pure state on the boundary, and that's the black hole, and it's a different microstate for every. So we are assuming this, right? That every microstate of the young Mills, with enough energy, is some other black hole. Yes, the some other microstate of the black hole. That's the starting mm -hmm. point. Uh, I thought the black hole corresponds to a thermal state of the boundary. Well, okay, that but that's part the, of the question. You see, so the, suppose if you had really a thermal state, I think there is no debate. But suppose you have a pure state. Yeah, okay, that's the real question. That does it look like a horizon? horizon? Yes, exactly. <laughs> How does the horizon arise? <coughs> Yeah. So, if you want a somewhat sharp version of, of that kind of question, this not as sharp as I'd like, but um, in the conventional semi-classical picture of Hawking radiation, you have a particle antiparticle pairs near the horizon, it's one inside, one outside. Can you describe that process in the boundary CFT? And can you describe the future causal connection of the inside and outside partners? If you could do that, then I think most of the information loss paradox could at least be phrased in a way that it would be easy to 
to see what kinds of solutions were available. You know, again, my reaction is that uh, I understand, but it's not the question phrased in a way that a unitary S matrix theory would be able to answer because you you really want to send in an observer who does measure something in the interior, right? If I understand correctly. Yeah. And uh, this is what's very hard to describe in young needs. Uh, I mean, if you could phrase this kind of question as something that Bob can measure on the boundary, then it would be much simpler. Uh, but see, that that's the point that mm -hmm. When we actually do experiments here, we're not doing them at the boundary. I know. And so the, the, these problems yeah. come from a disconnect between whether you can describe an experiment done in the interior <clears throat> in terms of boundary observables. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we are back always to this question. The infalling observer, you know, has to be now part of the young Mills theory. Mm -hmm. He's conducting the experiment, and that's where I think the ideas are not clear. I mean, at least in my mind, maybe Gary will clarify more. But, uh, but it's, a, it's obviously the good question. Yeah. Is there any geometric intuition or geometric description of the holographic correspondence between general relativity and Yang-Mill theory in terms of the fundamental variables. I mean, in general relativity, you have a metric or either a spin connection for the Lorentz group and a tetrad field. And in Yang-Mills, you have connections in internal spaces for other groups which are not related to the space and time. Is there any geometric intuition between this uh, in well, this correspondence? Yeah, I mean, it's kinematic almost. So the metric, the asymptotic form of the metric gets mapped to the energy momentum tensor of the dual theory. It's dual too, doesn't get mapped. Okay? I mean, I, I didn't try to understand, but roughly speaking, if you want it, let me say it as follows, if you wanted a bulk theory that only has Einstein, nothing else, you will need in the boundary a theory that has only an energy momentum tensor, and all other operators would be infinitely massive in the sense of having extremely high scaling dimensions. So that gives, so <clears throat> you know, that's the most basic piece of the correspondence. The energy momentum tensor of the boundary theory is sourced, is dual, if you want, to the graviton in the bulk. I don't know if this helps. N not anything gauge variant of the boundary has no meaning. No, you have to only form gauge invariant physical quantities in the boundary <coughs> to map them to something in the bulk. Um, first, just to say, you, 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 you reacted to some of my... Uh, I, I want to say I completely agree with everything you said, and <coughs> obviously, and, and uh, my list was obviously biased, so I'm sure one can make a list of ups and downs in various ways. <laughs> Um, now, <coughs> coming to physics, um, I want to make a, a, a comment uh, and, uh, and, and then it turns into a question. The comment is that uh, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, black hole bounds that we're studying in, uh, in, in quantum gravity, in loop quantum gravity, uh, fits this scenario. So if, if, the, if the overall scenario is the one you are describing, um, it would be compatible with the way we're, we're describing it. Namely, uh, there's a full quantum story um, in which uh, if information is preserved through the singularity in some manner and, and goes out. Uh, and then there's a classical limit in which you recover generativity more and more and more. And when you go to the limit in the singularity, everything, as you say, goes to hell and then in, 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 in it disappears. Now, in the scenario we are studying, uh, you can cross the area of zero singularity, which opens up in some known classical okay, superposition of geometries, something like that. And on the other side, uh, you're within an anti trap system. So, uh, the first approximation is the time of the first so, so, it's like the center, basically, and expanding. Uh, no, it's <coughs> like inside of a white hole. So, okay. the, but that's, in some sense, it's like a big bang. 
Yeah, so seeing from the past, uh, going to the quantum region <coughs> is to fall into a singularity. Seeing from the future, going to the quantum right. region is going to the past singularity of the extended crucial. Uh, so then this means that whatever comes out, uh, from the point of view of classical genetivity, comes, uh, comes out from a white hole horizon. Um, now, I guess the ideological difference, is, uh, or the ideological hypothesis, uh, is that we expect uh, that something like Wigner freedom in moving the classical boundary down, it's possible, while you say probably not. Namely, uh, away from the horizon, away from everything which is quantum, uh, um, before going to the exact limit, nevertheless, classical theory is a very good approximation. So we want to consider everything classical except for the small crossing of the quantum region and just study the, the, the amplitude, the, the transition amplitude uh, there. So that was just the, the comment. And the, and the specific point I want to make is that if this picture is, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's credible, this suggests that the right question is, uh, um, the classical theory becomes an approximation uh, when n goes to infinity or h bar goes to zero, I, I will probably think about that. What is the actual geometry uh, that you reconstruct, uh, because uh, it, if we don't believe in firewalls, it has to go inside the horizon, it has got somehow closer to r equals zero, and on the other hand, uh, is what we don't understand yet. Uh, presumably, is not just near Minkowski the space that happened, but there is something that, that happened, which can still have a classical des description, uh, all the way to the quantum position. I'm just Thrown there, yeah. uh, the, the way that the picture might not be so different after all when we discuss the same problem. Just react, then I will give the words to Gary. I mean, you know, I have no a priori for what will happen. It could well be that there is no classical description for the outgoing thing. It's purely quantum, and after all, the idea of Hawking radiation spreading out everywhere, you know, people in LHC neutral for the process that Gabriele described. <clears throat> we're trying to put detectors everywhere and see uh, 150 particles coming out. They again find them, so there's no black hole at LHC. Okay. But uh, uh, I have no a priori. That's precisely the kind of thing that one should calculate. And I would <laughs> say that the only physicist's reason, mostly to be interested in this is if you can use it then for the Big Bang or for some, oh, you know, because, be let me put it differently, I don't disagree, everyone would agree that something fuzzy goes in there, things are not commutative, uh, space-time is discrete, all the words are of course in a way right. What we are missing is the equations, and if we had precise equations, we could maybe then transfer them to the Big Bang. I mean, that's at least my impression. Yeah, I got it. So, so I'm going to give an argument tomorrow that in the context of, of holography with asymptotically antecedent boundary conditions, you can't uh, bounce. You can't go through a black hole um, singularity and enter a region which, again, can be described eventually in some semi-classical geometry, with, which is asymptotically ADS. So I'll, I'll describe this tomorrow. Um, and there's a cosmological version as well, which says you can't bounce through sort of cosmological singularities. Um, uh, in, in, again, if, where you start off with asymptotically anti-desider initial data, and you would classically evolve to a singularity which extends all the way up to infinity. Um, Can I just ask so. what this precisely means in, in the following sense? Mm -hmm. um, if you have a uranium atom, and you study the tunneling, yeah. Uh, there are two ways of describing it, which is the same, and we understand the relation between the two. One is that there will wave function of the alpha particle inside that spread, so you go in a very quantum state. Yeah. The other is that you have a guy in the detector that clicks, and at some specific moment, you go back to a, a situation that you can describe the semi-classically. <coughs> you have just a particle that has... The, 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 the radioactivity has particles being emitted at some specific time. Now, the two are not in contradiction to one another. It's just uh, 
quantum mechanics. I mean, whether you make a measurement, you go into, you choose a branch, you make a measurement depending on the way you think about quantum mechanics. But there's no contradiction between the two. So we can think after a quantum process as a spreading in different, of, of a non-quantum situation, or simply as a, uh, the coherence happen, which is just one branch, and we can compute the probability of which branch you are, which is the usual way we think about quantum mechanics. So, isn't this the possible? Um, no, we, we should talk about okay. this. Yeah, okay. So, I think we should thank again the speaker and have the break. Yeah.